So this is a, a first for Worcester Business Journal. We are launching a new feature called Executive to Executive. Uh, in print, it'll be a Q&A style feature where heads of leading organizations and leading companies in central Massachusetts sort of uh, just kind of chat and talk shop about what it's like to do business here and uh, hopefully learn a little bit from each other and then uh, we can learn a lot from them. Uh, so the first one, a uh, very strong out of the gate, we have uh, Jack Roach, President and CEO of the Hanover Insurance Group in Worcester. And then we have Dr. Eric Dixon, the President and CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare in Worcester. Um, so Jack and Eric, I'll let you guys uh, take the wheel now. Um, just All right. uh, go back and forth. Um, I'm actually gonna jump off the video, so just to let you two guys have at it, but I, I will be uh, behind the scenes in case you need me. Well, thank you, Brad, and thank you, Jack, for the opportunity. This is, uh, uh, you know, a real pleasure. I, I guess I always wanted to be a reporter, so to get to interview uh, Jack Roach right out of the gate, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. So, Jack, I'll start you off with the first question, if you don't mind. I'll just a lot of people understand how COVID-19 has impacted healthcare, obviously caring for the patients, but I don't think a lot of people understand how it's impacted. Uh, the insurance industry, and so how, how has how has it impacted you? Well, as you can imagine, uh, almost all of our customers, whether they be families or businesses, have been affected by this pandemic, and so we we uh, insure businesses as well as uh, personal uh, uh, goods and families. So uh, we're acutely aware of all the challenges that. Um, folks are going through these days, and um, there is an impact on us from a business standpoint. Um, there are certain types of um, coverages that apply uh, to the pandemic, and, and whether it be workers' compensation or some um, select business interruption types coverages. Probably the biggest thing from a business perspective is that as companies in particular have to uh, shelter in place and the economy pulls back a bit, uh, we essentially insure the GDP. So as the GDP comes down, so do our revenues. And so yeah. we'll, we'll have to endure a little bit of a financial uh, setback on the top line, um, and, but we'll, we'll be fine. And we have a, 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 a profitable, well-balanced uh, portfolio. So uh, I have every confidence that our business will endure this and, and be there for our customers. Internally, Eric, I would tell you that uh, our, I'm really impressed with the way our 4,300 employees have been able to respond. Our technology and our virtual capabilities have exceeded our expectations. So we're, we're uh, ready to serve and we're, our culture is alive and kicking despite the obstacles that we're all facing together. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we're in reasonably good shape. Great to hear, great to hear. Maybe I'll bounce one back at you if that's okay. Uh, and this is a, a pleasure, uh, really a joy uh, format that Brad has put together here. You know, I was reflecting as we were talking about doing this uh, interview um, that soon after I took this role two and a half years ago, uh, you were one of the first people that uh, uh, rang my phone and, and, and asked to come pay a visit and uh, extended your assistance to uh, help me as I transition into the CEO role of the Hanover. But you also expressed um, an interest to further strengthen the networking of the business community and the overall leadership community inside of Worcester. Uh, and you thought that business leaders could play a critical role in the community development. So maybe you could elaborate for the Worcester Business Journal audience on, on uh, your passions around this. And I, and I do try to visit with every new CEO and stay in touch with all of the CEOs in, in central Massachusetts, you know, really for two reasons. And uh, one is that our mission is to improve the health of the diverse populations of central Massachusetts. That's why UMass Memorial exists. Our owners are the people of Massachusetts as a not-for-profit and you know, an important part of improving the health is in, ensuring um, that good jobs are available for people. It gives them a sense of purpose. It gives them the, 
ability to um, you know, feed their family and good housing is available. And I think that you know, all of the businesses in this region and, as, and especially Hanover, uh, because it's so big and it's played such a leadership role for, for decades uh, in terms of developing this community, I think we all have this responsibility to try to create a thriving uh, community. And, and, and that means that we have to do things that we might do outside of our, wouldn't typically do as part of our business, invest in downtown um, uh, as, as Hanover has done, um, put money into lower income housing, hire from uh, zip codes that um, are of the poorest uh, people in, in the region. And uh, you know, we, we have zip codes in central Massachusetts and in Worcester in particularly where there's a 15 year difference in life inspected expectancy two year, two miles apart. And so I think you know, the, the businesses in this community um, have a responsibility and have really an ability to impact the health by their hiring practices, by their investment practices. Um, and, and I see it as part of my job in healthcare to, to make sure that business leaders understand that, what a positive impact they can have on the overall health of their community and, and of their own employees. And, um, you know, the second thing is you're a customer to us, right? We uh, sell healthcare services and you got the, uh, one of the largest employee bases in Central Mass. And so I like to go out and meet the customers and understand um, where we're doing a good job and where we need to, to work on it. And uh, I get a lot of great information by going out and, and meeting with the HR directors and the CEOs of local companies about how well we're meeting their needs and, um, and ways that they can sometimes save money on the cost of their medical insurance, which is probably a significant cost that you have for your employees. Uh, I, I've just learned a, a great, great deal by, by doing those early visits and continuing to network with uh, local CEOs. Well, that's awesome. And I, for one, was very appreciative of that early visit. And uh, it, uh, it shows you really do care about our community. Thank you. So COVID has changed um, our business forever in a couple of different ways. I like to say the, the genie is out of the bottle when it comes to telemedicine. Uh, the, you know, our, our providers, our physicians often didn't think they would want to do this. Our patients didn't think they would want to do this. And then suddenly COVID strikes and um, it's been accepted by uh, the providers and the patients. And it continues on even past needing to do uh, virtual medicine visits. We're also seeing changes in our workforce and whether or not it is we bring them back or they, we keep them at home. Do you have a sense as to whether in your um, industry there's going to be more virtual, more work from home? Uh, is there is there an equivalent of a telemedicine visit uh, in in the insurance business? Yeah, I, Eric, I believe that this pandemic and the economic fallout um, will be a major catalyst for industry change uh, inside the property and casualty business. So both in terms of how we interface with our agents and our customers ultimately, I think is going to change and it's been changing, but I think the pace of change will accelerate substantially. Uh, so I'll maybe mention a couple of things on that front. And then I'll come back to the employee piece because we've been on a journey as a company to provide more flexible work arrangements. And I think this, again, this situation is going to allow us to accelerate that um, but we, we want to make sure that we come to a healthy balance because we have a culture where people like uh, interacting with each other. And so we'll, uh, I'll speak a little bit to that. But, uh, but quickly, on the, on, the, on the industry front, uh, much of the process and the uh, interaction between customers and the independent agents that we work through and the insurance carers is still uh, pretty archaic. Uh, if we're really honest with ourselves, it's still, I've been at this for 35 years and, and, and the process, while the computers are a little bit different and there's a lot more data being involved, um, the interactions are still, I think, not what other industries have evolved to. So um, 
we have been on a path to increase our digitization and our ability to augment face-to-face -face interactions with uh, better ways to allow customers to explore insurance solutions, better ways to settle particularly smaller claims that don't require the face-to-face -face interactions. And as you can imagine, this, this pandemic has forced that to happen almost overnight. We're using uh, camera and video apps and the take up rate is substantial now. People are comfortable, um, you know, working in this kind of remote environment and interfacing. And frankly, we're seeing some productivity improvements almost instantaneously. Um, you can imagine uh, appraisers that are looking at cars that have had accidents that have to drive out and look at the car. And those things are now being done and the, and the technology was evolving, but the take up rate was relatively slow. This will truly serve as a catalyst to get some of that capability to just come alive faster. And people have grown comfortable with this uh, kind of new way of doing business quite, quite quickly. Uh, again, on the employee side, um, we're really excited that uh, we are able to stand up over 95% of our employees to work from home, uh, to be safe, to be productive. And um, so that's a very positive thing. But we also hear from particularly some people where their personal arrangement at home isn't highly conducive to working from home. And so we've tried not to broad brush across 4,300 employees, you know, one homogenous kind of view or message. And we've been trying to accommodate those that have more challenges working from home. Um, and, uh, but at the same point, you know, uh, take advantage of the fact that there's many that can. So as we look forward, we're really excited about taking the flexible work arrangement uh, approach that we were advancing. And before the pandemic hit, we were up to about 47% of our employees had some form of flexible arrangement, whether that was working Fridays from home or shortening uh, their work week and doing some things after hours, um, all relatively well managed, but this will allow us to go faster. And I think it'll great that, I, I, I heard somebody use a term the other day uh, to, to assist not work-life balance, but work-life blending. And I thought that was a nice terminology because work-life balance makes it feel like you don't wanna work hard. Uh, but work-life blending says that we can really get, be productive, but it shouldn't really matter when and how I do my work as long as the outcomes are what we are looking to achieve. I thought that was a great concept. Okay. So let me, uh, let me move down my list here of questions that I had for you. I, I think you and I have talked about this in the past, but we're both you know, internal successors to the CEO role within our firms. And, and that's, a, I think, a very positive reflection on, on um, both, um, both companies, frankly, when you can, um, when you can uh, develop the talent from within. Um, but obviously there's challenges with being that internal successor uh, you work with a lot of folks, a lot of folks that were your peers before. So maybe you could share with the audience what that transition was like for you and how you, how did that internal succession help you uh, in that transition and, and what were some of the challenges that came with uh, being the insider? Yeah. And in, in some ways it, it, it was even a little bit harder for me because I was a student here before as a medical student and a resident and people remember you in those roles often and, and, and have a hard time thinking about you as CEO. So I had a great boss for um, uh, many years here, John O'Brien, who was the, the longest running CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare. And um, when, when John was uh, re retiring and making this transition, you know, he, had, he had picked up the organization in really rough shape when he came in as CEO and turned it around. And what I what I watched him do then is what I recognized I needed to do is he immediately set a vision for the organization. And he said, we wanna be a top 10 academic health science system. And we had cups that said that, and there were t-shirts that said that. And it, it was a little bit hard to imagine given 
you know, the, some of the, where the place was at at that uh, time. But, you know, we were here and John said, we want to be here. And that's the goal. And that's what we're working towards and establish that vision. And for the 11 years that he was CEO, he'd stayed true to that and worked towards that, despite a lot of things that were trying to keep you, keep the organization down, an external environment, um, governmental regulations, everything that could come in. But it, you know, the one thing that most importantly I learned from John is establish that vision and drive to it. But as, as John was leaving and he, he did six weeks with me and just introduced me to everyone and transitioned the role. He, he was such a good friend during that period of time. He, he said, Eric, you're going to have to come out with a new vision, right? You can't just pick it up and, and, and stay with that. They're going to want to see something different and um, put everyone in a movie theater, all the you know, uh, top 400 managers in the organization. And um, what the team had come up with is really focusing on two things, uh, uh, perfecting the customer experience, which is our patient and their family's experience, and perfecting the caregiver experience. And that piece had been neglected, I think, um, and, and forgotten about how important it is to take care of our workforce. And so we came out with a new slogan and we had a contest for coming up with an image a symbol that would remind of us of it. And what, what we finally came up with was best place to give care, best place to get care. And that every move we made uh, moving forward, every decision we made was going to work to make things better for our patients and our people. And we, and we said best place to give care intentionally first, not because it was more important, but just so everyone understood that if we didn't take great care of our people, our frontline workforce, they weren't going to be able to take great care of our patients. And so it became a compact of sorts between management and, um, and the frontline workforce that we're going to do everything we can to take care of you. And, uh, and we'll depend on you to do everything you can to take great care of our patients. And it's driven us now for seven years. Um, and, it, and certainly through the, the crisis that we've just uh, been through. We had to make a decision about layoffs and furloughs and a lot of other healthcare systems are, you know, a big decline as we did in, in, in revenue. And, you know, we have a, a, a culture built on respect for people and as the foundation and, and made the decision, we're not going to do that right now. This is scary for everyone. They're coming in and working in the hazardous environment. They feel insecure with their job. And we probably could have saved five to ten million dollars in doing that, but that, um, but I believe because we didn't, we've recovered from this much faster than the other healthcare systems around us. And uh, you know, so establishing that vision, I think, is is the absolute key, and then holding to it so it's not just a tagline; it actually becomes part of the culture. And putting our people first, so they can put our patients first, has has been what it's been all about. And um, I think, you know, it was on John's advice and, uh, and you know, he's been a wonderful friend uh, throughout the most recent crisis or other things we've been through. I'll get a text from him here. Great yeah. article I saw in the paper. You're doing a wonderful job. And, you know, I, I think it's a source of pride for him that somebody that he helped develop moved into the role. And I know it's a source of pride for Fred in seeing you in this uh, 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 role. And, when I bump into him, he just he's laudatory about the great job that you're doing. Yeah, that's uh, well, awesome. That's I think uh, I think we've talked in the past that uh, vision-based organizations uh, have an advantage, right? That that employees need to know where they're going. They need to feel like they're part of something special. Uh, that's certainly uh, what attracted to me, frankly, to the Hanover 15 years ago. Was I thought it. Fred and, and the team had put together a, a pretty good business strategy, but more importantly, had laid out where they thought the industry was going, not where it was, and how we could reposition the company to be an even more significant player and eventually leader in this business. And most people know in the Worcester community that, you know, we had had a bit of a fall from grace. Uh, the life and annuity business had, had gone sideways on All America but there was this precious kind of property casualty company within called the Hanover 
and we were able to reposition that and let the property casualty company co come to the forefront. But what made that possible was a similar story where Fred and, and, and the team had laid out a vision that said, the industry will transform. Independent agents will need to think of their insurance carriers as partners, not just suppliers of insurance. And we were able to spend really the last decade and a half repositioning the company to be a very unique partner to the best distributors in our business. Um, and that's what got 4,300 people jazzed about what we're doing because they saw that's where we were going. And each day and each month and each year as that, as that vision became a reality, the engagement level of the firm just got stronger and stronger. So, uh, so there's a real parallel between uh, the journey you've been on and, and certainly the journey we've been on. So Jack, one of the things that surprised me is becoming CEO um, was that people want you to comment or take a position often on things that have nothing to do with your business or seemingly have nothing to do with your business at the time. Climate change, I got a note from one of our doctors who wanted me to support a bill related to climate change um, and obviously has a long-term health impact, but um, um, and we see the social unrest um, that we have right now because of, of you know, racism still existing in this country. And uh, it's, it always seems like these the potential hot button issues that you'd want to stay away from, but people look to us as CEOs to take a stance or a position or at least to use the megaphone we've been given in these roles to, to speak on things. And how do, you, how do you balance that overall, your personal beliefs, your what, what's best for the company? Um, with over 4,000 employees, you're never gonna get, say something that everyone's gonna agree on. Have you found that to be a challenge? And, and have you any advice to me in terms of how, uh, how to manage it in this role? Well, there is no doubt um, that that comes with the job these days. Uh, I, I think that uh, as a publicly traded company, um, they're uh, a good portion of the capital that we attract is coming from uh, passive and active institutional investors who now look beyond just quarterly earnings and pure financial views they look at the sustainability of the company and they use an ESG type format, which is environmental, social, and governance. And they essentially grade publicly traded companies on how well they treat the environment or, or live in the environment, how well they uh, help the society that they, they work and live in and how well the company is governed, including whether they're a good corporate citizen. So, you know, I think in some ways this was harder five and 10 years ago where there was this feeling that investors wanted to get higher return on equity and they didn't care so much about how you got the job done. Uh, today, it's a requirement. And uh, so that helps. I think you do have a forum by which you can speak about, um, kind of the multiple stakeholders that you're trying to satisfy. Shareholders, uh, employees, in our case, our independent agents that, that, that we do business with, and certainly the communities that we work in. What I'm most grateful of is that, and again, one of the reasons why I joined the firm is that the culture that was built here always made that important long ahead of it becoming fashionable. Yep. And so if you work for the Hanover and you came here because you wanted that to be part of the new and improved company we were building. Uh, but to your point, Eric, it is, it's the challenge I think is to make sure that you don't take your personal views and drive them through the front door of the organization. You have to get a sense for what, what is it that a company should be stepping up on. And you and I have talked about the, you know, the, the racial equality issues, the, the unrest that lives today, um, this is a problem. 
And this is a problem for our society. And essentially, it's a, it's a problem for our business if we don't step up and help make some of the systemic issues go away and get better. So we've been spending time inside the firm with uh, our executive team, which is called our partner group, where we truly partner to run this company. We have some business resource groups inside the company, including um, uh, a black American uh, group called Kinship Village. Um, I recently had a session with our board of directors on this topic because of the importance of it. And I've been trying to spend time bringing those views together and, and trying to establish what it is beyond the inclusion and diversity uh, efforts that we've made over the last two and a half, three years um, to really advance our awareness and our, and our, our inclusive environment. What else can we do? And uh, I won't go into it in detail here, but we're going we're gonna to step up and we're going to do more than just say nice things. We're going to uh, change the way we recruit into the community. We're going to change kind of the, 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 the folks that we engage with to try to help some of these issues um, um, come alive and really uh, sustain themselves so that we don't, we don't look back a year or two from now and say, well, a lot of people said some nice things, but, uh, but, but all that enthusiasm and engagement went away. The number one thing that I heard from our uh, folks inside the company is that they want to see these courageous conversations perpetuate. They want to see us create venues and forums to have the conversation to get uh, people closer to what the issues are and so that we can start to solve together uh, and frankly we're 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 really motivated to do so wonderful so uh, building off of that um, I would I would say we've been through uh, a lot over the last uh, few months uh, with this pandemic and being in the healthcare business, I can only imagine this has been a daunting for you and, and, and your, your team. And I guess I was wondering, um, as particularly as the surge built and you started to feel the temperature rising in terms of uh, the capacity within the hospital, uh, the concerns that were coming upon your employees, particularly when some of the PPE maybe wasn't uh, optimal in the early days. I'm curious what you did to try to keep the optimism and to keep folks um, encouraged uh, when things were feeling quite desperate. Um, you know, I wonder if you could share some of that with us. You know, one of the, um, one of the interesting things in medicine is that when it's, slow and you, you have time to complain about things um, and there's no pressing issue and there's no critical patient before you. Um, you know, that, that's sometimes when it's the, the hardest time to keep people motivated and moving forward. But the trauma rolls in the door, the stroke rolls in the door, something happens. And in medicine, it's almost automatic. We just put all that aside. We focus on the care of the patients. We put the patients first and we take care of them. And this, you know, we saw coming and everyone just um, really united against this common enemy that was this COVID. And we just, you know, we're gonna save as many lives as we can. We knew that we would lose people to this. We knew it was gonna get bad, but what we talked about is saving as many lives as we can. And my job really was to say, we will get through this. This will peak, this will come down, and, um, and we will keep you safe. Um, I tried to spend as much time as I could on the floors, in the COVID units, taking care of patients, working in the COVID tents so that the workforce didn't think I was asking them to do something and put them, them into a hazardous environment that I wouldn't go in my, myself. And I think keeping them motivated was the easiest job in the world. They just, you know, when they recognized how bad of a disease this was um, uh, and how much this community needed us, um, whether it be at the DCU center or in our ICUs, they just um, were incredibly focused and, and, and rallied. Um, 
my job was to see the, all right, this will pass. We will get through this. And I must have said that, you know, a hundred times in our virtual town halls and, and things like that. And now the challenge for me is we're past this and there's this lull and we're tired and we worked really hard. Well, we've got to recover and get all these patients in 90% of cancer screening um, stopped when uh, COVID was here. And, you know, we're seeing late stage disease that we could have taken care of earlier. And um, it's, it's actually harder now to keep people rallying and focused um, that we're back more towards status quo. And, uh, but that's the role of leadership. You, it's, you know, uh, you're climbing one hill after another and you're gonna keep people focused on that long-term vision, which you're trying to achieve and uh, make sure you know, you tell them you're gonna take care of them along the way and that they see that they're part of a company that they can be proud to be a part of. And, um, and, and that's the environment we're trying to create. And Brad, I don't know, do we have time for one more question? Uh, we... You probably have all the time in the world. Um, <laughs> I think you've probably talked to your individual schedulers about your availability, but uh, it's 9.35. Um, I'm happy to keep recording as long as you guys want to talk, but uh, I know you are busy people. So, uh, Jeff, what do you do when you're not CEO of uh, Hanover? Right? And what, is, what are your passions outside of work? Well, I have a, a, a great family, so I try to spend as much time as I can with them. Uh, I have four children that are all uh, grown up, uh, two of them living down in Boston, one going to school in Maryland, and uh, one that actually will be heading out uh, to go to the Marines uh, oh, on, on Monday. So we've been spending a lot of time together. Um, and and uh, together, we, we, we like to, when, when we can, we like to go down to Florida and, and, and uh, spend some time on the beach and play some golf around here. I think we're all uh, uh, enjoy the game of golf and, and uh, to some degree tennis and just get out and be outside. And, and frankly, during this time, that's been important, right? Is, you know, golf, yeah. if you do it safely, has been one of the things that you can kind of social distance and still get out and breathe the air and, and, uh, and, uh, and not just be stay cooped up inside. Um, but uh, for Grace and I, my wife, really, uh, we're kind of going into full empty nester syndrome. So uh, once all this passes, I think we, we have a new... Uh, leash on life. We're going to try to travel more and try to be uh, and, and to find additional ways to be active in the community. Um, I've enjoyed in the 15 years that I've been working in the Worcester um, community, I've enjoyed being part of it. And, um, and so I think that's something that I want to uh, find where the next opportunities might be for me to make a difference as we try to build on the success of the central Massachusetts area. Um, and, and, and also, I think these times have really focused all of us on where, uh, where are the disconnects? Where are the people that aren't getting embraced into the community? And, and what I love about Worcester, as I've been here, is that it really is a caring town. It is, it, yes, it's the second largest city in New England, but it's a caring town. It, uh, I've been amazed in my time working with the United Way and now with the Worcester Together Fund. I mean, imagine in short order being able to raise almost $10 million to help the, the less fortunate people get through this, this crazy pandemic. Uh, I think it's an absolutely remarkable thing and, and, and frankly, um, uh, really been... Uh, a pleasure to be part of. So I think it motivates me to, to see what else we can do to, to make a difference. That's wonderful. Well, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure to, to, to speak with you today and to interview um, you. And I appreciate Brad setting this up. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to seeing how it comes out. Yes. And, and maybe if I could, uh, in, 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 in my final comments here, I would be remiss if I didn't really congratulate you for all the work that UMass did during this time. I know we're not, it's not over and we all can't declare victory yet, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you on behalf of a lot of people in this community that depended on, on the, your leadership and, and the, uh, the services and the support of the hospital. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll make sure I relay those thanks to the 14,000 people that did all the work to make it 
happen and take care of the community. Thanks, Brad. Yes, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we're all set. I thought that was amazing. Um, <laughs> a lot of fun. You. Yeah, it was great. Very. Uh, we're get we're getting good at this virtual thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> The Hollywood Squares or the Brady Bunch. I don't know which one we want to call this. But yeah, that's stuff. awesome. All right, Eric, let's stay in touch. Uh, we'll, when it's when it's appropriate, we'll get together and, uh, and uh, break some bread. Look forward to it. Take okay. care, everyone. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, gentlemen.